Whenever you run a biochemical profile on your patient, you'll find that there are many electrolytes in that information and you really need to understand what they mean. So that's the purpose uh, today is to help you understand the meaning of the electrolytes on your profile. Before we start though, it's important for me to emphasize that electrolyte disorders are secondary to other diseases and are not diseases in and of themselves. So it's very important that you also diagnose and appropriately treat the underlying disease. With that said, we will talk about the individual electrolytes. The first one we'll talk about is the serum sodium concentration. And probably the single most important thing to understand about the serum sodium concentration is that it does not really give you information about the total body content of sodium, but actually tells you about the amount of sodium relative to the amount of water. So usually when there are abnormalities in the serum sodium concentration, it's because there's either too much or too little water in the blood, not too much or too little sodium. So as far as hypernatremia or increased sodium concentration, this can come about in three possible ways, through pure water loss, through hypotonic fluid loss, through the gastrointestinal tract or from the kidneys, or into a third space such as the peritoneal space, or from the gain of impermeant solute. But honestly, hypotonic fluid losses are the most important of these three. With hyponatremia or decreased serum sodium concentration, this can be a little more challenging because hyponatremia can occur with hypervolemia in three particular situations that are all characterized by activation of the renin angiotensin tensin aldosterone system. And that would include severe liver disease, congestive heart failure, and nephrotic syndrome caused by glomerular disease. You can also see hyponatremia with normal circulating volume, such as in an animal with psychogenic polydipsia, or if an animal has received drugs that interfere with water excretion. Finally, you can see hyponatremia in patients with hypovolemia, and actually this is most common, such as with GI, gastrointestinal losses, third space loss, or with hypoadrenocorticism, or with diuretic administration. Now, you may ask yourself the question, how can hyponatremia develop with hypotonic losses? Uh, that does not seem logical because you would expect hypernatremia to develop, as we initially said. But hyponatremia can develop with hypotonic losses because of a situation called non-osmotic stimulation of antidiuretic hormone release. So severe volume depletion can lead to ADH release from the brain which can impair water excretion by the kidney. So the animal then continues to drink water, but the kidneys can't excrete the water very well, so hyponatremia develops. So although it might seem counterintuitive, it's not unusual for hyponatremia to develop in the face of volume depletion. Let's look at the serum chloride concentration. Chloride and bicarbonate are the only important reabsorbable anions in, in, in tubular fluid and abnormalities in one often create abnormalities in the other. So that the normal ratio of a sodium to chloride in the blood or extracellular fluid is about 1.3 to 1. Whereas whenever an animal loses or gains equal amounts of sodium and chloride, it will disturb that relationship of 1.3 to 1. Hyperchloremia can be caused by excessive loss of sodium relative to chloride, such as with diarrhea. The fluids that are lost with diarrhea are rich in bicarbonate, and so you lose more sodium relative to chloride, and that leads to hyperchloremia. Also, if we have excessive gain of, of chloride relative to sodium, such as would occur, for example, with administration of 0.9% saline, which has equal amounts of sodium and chloride, that will tend to cause a relative excess of chloride in the extracellular fluid and hyperchloremia. Finally, the kidneys can retain excessive amounts of chloride. The most common example here would be when the kidneys respond to chronic respiratory alkalosis, they need to retain more chloride so that they can lower the level of bicarbonate in the blood. And so that's another important cause of hyperchloremia. On the other hand, hypochloremia or decreased chloride concentration is most commonly associated with vomiting of stomach contents uh, because those stomach contents are high in chloride concentration. Also, administration of diuretics such as furosemide can lead to hypochloremia because you are losing equal amounts of sodium and chloride in the urine and disturbing that relationship of 1.3 to 1 in the extracellular fluid. Finally, as the kidneys compensate for chronic respiratory acidosis, they need to decrease the chloride concentration in the blood 
while increasing the bicarbonate concentration in the blood. So that is also a cause of hypoluremia. Looking at serum potassium concentration, the situation is a little different because both potassium and phosphate are solutes that are primarily found within cells. So there are three ways we can cause changes in the potassium concentration. We can cause hyperkalemia by increased intake, decreased excretion, or movement of potassium from within the cells in intracellular fluid to outside of the cells, extracellular fluid. So some combination of increased intake, translocation, or decreased excretion can lead to hyperkalemia. Now increased intake alone, if it's coming in through the diet, is very unlikely to cause hyperkalemia. On the other hand, if you make a mistake with your IV fluid therapy and put too much potassium in the fluids, it certainly can cause hyperkalemia. So again, important to think of hyperkalemia as potentially arising from either increased intake, translocation from intracellular to extracellular fluid, or decreased renal excretion, or more likely, some combination of these things. Hypokalemia, the same principle. Hypokalemia can arise from decreased intake, translocation in the other direction, from extracellular fluid to intracellular fluid, or through increased loss, either through the gastrointestinal tract or through the kidneys. So very similar to the way we look at hyperkalemia, but just on the other side of the coin, causing decreased intake or translocation or increased loss. Okay, the other electrolyte we would like to look at is calcium. Now calcium is pretty complicated because as you see here, the serum calcium concentration is regulated by three hormones, parathyroid hormone, calcitriol, which is active vitamin D, and calcitonin acting together on three different organ systems in the body, the kidney, the bone, and the gastrointestinal tract. And those three hormones acting on those three organs regulate the serum calcium concentration. Another factor that makes understanding the calcium concentration a little bit difficult is when you measure the calcium on your biochemical profile, you're getting the total serum calcium concentration, but hidden within that total are three components that you can't see. The ionized concentration, the complex concentration, and the protein-bound concentration. And this is important because 40% of that calcium is bound to plasma protein, albumin. So changes in the blood albumin concentration can affect your total calcium concentration. If we look at hypercalcemia, there are a number of important causes of hypercalcemia. Dehydration is a very common cause and a very reversible cause. But probably one of the most important causes of hypercalcemia are various malignancies. And the two most important ones in dogs are lymphosarcoma and apocrine gland adenocarcinoma of the anal sac are very important malignancies that can be associated with hypercalcemia. Hypoadrenocorticism or Addison's disease can be associated with hypercalcemia, as can certain patients with chronic renal failure, hypervitaminosis D, which can occur with certain intoxications, and then finally primary hyperparathyroidism where you have a, usually a benign tumor of the parathyroid gland overproducing parathyroid hormone. Hypocalcemia can also be caused by a number of different conditions. Probably the most important of these is actually hypoalbuminemia. As you may recall what I just said earlier, when the serum albumin concentration is decreased, it decreases the protein-bound component of the serum calcium and leads to a decrease in the total calcium concentration. This is very important to recognize because these animals are otherwise normal. If you look at their ionized calcium concentration, it's perfectly normal. So, I would encourage you anytime you have a decrease in the total calcium concentration on the biochemical profile, and if the animal looks otherwise normal, look first at the serum albumin concentration and make sure that hypoalbuminemia is not the cause of the decreased total calcium concentration. Other causes of hypocalcemia include kidney disease, ethylene glycol poisoning, eclampsia, and acute pancreatitis. And finally, a very important but relatively uncommon cause of hypocalcemia is primary hypoparathyroidism. Hyperphosphatemia and hypophosphatemia are disorders of the serum phosphorus concentration, and in analyzing a patient with changes in the serum phosphorus concentration, it's very similar to what we talked about for serum potassium concentration, because again, the phosphorus is primarily an intracellular solute. So hyperphosphatemia can occur 
by some combination of translocation of phosphorus from inside of the cells to outside of the cells, or decreased renal excretion, or increased intake, or some combination of these. Finally, young growing animals, less than one year of age, because of bone growth, will frequently have mild increases in their serum phosphorus concentration that are entirely normal. Hypophosphatemia is a relatively uncommon electrolyte disturbance in dogs and cats. And when you analyze that situation, again, you look at could this be translocation from extracellular fluid to intracellular fluid? And a great example of this is when you treat a patient with diabetic ketoacidosis, or DKA. When you treat that patient with, with insulin and the glucose goes inside the cells, you also get phosphorus going inside of the cells as well as potassium, and those things can contribute to hypophosphatemia and, as we mentioned earlier, hypokalemia. Uh, also, you can have decreased renal absorption of phosphorus uh, in the kidney, but this is relatively uncommon and, again, only likely with primary hyperparathyroidism. You can also have decreased intestinal absorption of phosphorus, but, again, not very common. You might see it with administration of phosphorus binders in a kidney uh, disease patient, for example. But in general, hypophosphatemia is relatively uncommon compared to hyperphosphatemia.